Hey folks, it's Don from BrainLinks.com. <clears throat> coffee, 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 coffee. Hey folks, it's Don from BrainBlinks.com, and I'm here with the often promised Mandelbulb 3D animation tutorial. All right, you get to the animation features by pressing this fancy little film strip here, and what you can kind of think of it as up here are slots. All these keyframes are basically slots to hold a copy of all the information in this main window. Everything that makes up the fractal, the camera, the coloring, the formulas, all that stuff. You basically copy that into a slot here with this button. Takes it from the main window, plops it in there. And now you can recall that information anytime you want by hitting this button. Pops it back into the main window. It's actually a great way to store information while you're working on a project. You can just pop up a hundred different versions of the same fractal in here if you want. Save them all under one file with this animation. This saves the animation. I use it all the time when I'm exploring looking for new fractals. So uh, Mandelbulb 3D uses a keyframe animation system so instead of making every single frame of the animation you you just make the key frames you make the important parts the the points at which this virtual camera or the formulas will morph between to make the final animation so for instance I've got this frame saved in my animation now I'm gonna make a second keyframe by just zooming in on this object That looks good. And we're going to put that. You can also put a new animation frame directly from your 3D navigator. You just want to be careful about where this white highlighted rectangle is. You want to make sure it's on a blank one before you put it over there, unless you're meaning to overwrite it. If you put it here, it would overwrite the information in that keyframe. I'm going to make another keyframe. So we zoomed in on this, and now I'm just going to shift over to the left a little bit. That'll help me demonstrate um, another feature here. Okay, that looks good. I'm going to hit, and I'm going to hit the F key. That'll plop it down in there too. That's a great feature. You can just fly through a shape, tapping on F every so often, and get a nice kind of uh, flying path through a fractal without much effort at all. Okay, so now we have three keyframes and we want to get a preview of what it's going to look like before we render out the final animation, which could take a long time. Um, that's what this is for, this preview thing. You can get a, a quick small render of the whole animation or just parts of it by changing the start and stop here. Right now I have subframes to render between each one is 120 so every time I make a new frame that value goes here. That means that it'll render 120 frames in between this set of parameters and this set of parameters. And same here. You can, man you can manually edit these uh, later too. So right now I'm going to render every third frame of this animation. And I'm going to downscale it by 3, so it's set at 800 by 450, so it'll be three times that small. And it should take about 31 seconds, apparently, to render this, so let's render the preview. And you can see right now, is it's um, calculating the changes between the first frame and the second frame. Okay, bam, it hit that second frame. Now it's going from the second frame to the third frame. You can see it's panning to the left like we did. You can also notice here, frames per second, this is how fast it's going to play back when it's done rendering here. So let's say we render every third frame. If I put this on 10, that means that'll, this is what this video would look like if you rendered it with these settings and played it back at 30 frames a second, 10 times 3, so 
it's good to keep track of that when you're trying to decide on the timing and the, the look of your um, video. So notice here, it zooms in, and it goes bam, and it hits this second frame, and then it's jerk, and it goes, then it starts panning to the left. That's because we have it set for linear subframe interpolation. If we set it to quadratic Bezier, what it's going to do is smooth out the changes between the cameras and the formula. So instead of a straight line between the points, it's going to draw a curvy, smooth line between all those points. It actually won't necessarily hit all of these keyframes exactly, but it'll hit the best line between all those. So let's render that preview and see what that looks like. It's important to keep in mind that it's not going to hit your frames exactly when you're using the Bezier curve. Uh, but there are ways to kind of trick it. If you Sometimes you can make a duplicate frame and then uh, uh, just do a small number of frames in between uh, the duplicate frames and that will kind of force the Bezier curve to go closer or exactly on the, the point that you're looking for. So let's see what it looks like now. You see, it's still kind of a, a quick transition, but it's not nearly as abrupt as before. Uh, it's a quick transition because we were moving really fast when we hit this point, and then we were going really slow. But you, you can definitely see the difference. I almost always use quadratic Bezier, uh, unless I'm looking for a specific geometric kind of boom 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 kind of animation okay so let's just pretend that this is uh, the animation how we like it and that we want to render that as the final animation usually uh, I would go back and forth you know dozens of times between the preview and tweaking this parameter tweak that change the camera change the timing and how many frames are being rendered um, but I'm trying to do this quick and dirty uh, let's see so to start rendering your animation, what the first thing you want to do, first thing I do is get the output folder set. Click output folder, um, and we're going to find a spot to put it. I'll just put it on my desktop. It's best to keep all of the images and stuff in one folder for these. I, I like to. Anyway, so there, it's going to now save it to that folder, all these images that it creates. Because what we're going to do is we're just going to set up all these parameters and then we're just going to let it go and let it render it each frame successively at the higher resolution. So it can take hundreds and hundreds of hours to do some of these animations that you see. I know I personally have had ones that take 700 hours, 1200 hours to do all the frames. So you want to make sure you got it, you got it down good before you let that sucker rip. <laughs> um, this controls the size of the animation even if uh, it does store the you know the resolution along with this frame here but this kind of overrides that so if I decided I wanted to render this at 1600 by 900 then I could do that here we're gonna leave it 800 by 450 for now that's a decent size for the demo anti-aliasing if you turn this on up to two, it'll actually, and you have this at 800 by 450, it'll actually render it at 16 by 9 and do the smoothing, annual aliasing, resizing, and then save your image at 800 by 450. Also, one thing to note, and something that someone on the forums just discovered and lost them some work, is if you're, even if you're rendering animation, if your view, if you change this, view it will save the image at this smaller size so even if you render at a high resolution and you're you wanted to see the animation while you're rendering don't change this viewing thing while you're rendering the animation just leave it at full size because that could affect your final at least that's my understanding of that anyway uh, so in this case we're not going to any alias I'll explain that this is important or if you want to start and stop your animation. I'll demonstrate that in a minute. 
this is the output format of your animation frames. Um, I actually generally use JPEG at, at a high a high quality volume. There's very little difference, and it takes up so much less space. Okay, um, other options would be the loop deanimation. Uh, that actually is kind of cool because you can make looping animations and uh, it actually goes from this frame back to the beginning. So if you set it up right, you can make some really cool seamless animations. You can check the last few videos I've done uh, and put up on YouTube are that way. Save Z buffer will save uh, a grayscale like alpha, not alpha mask. You could use it as alpha mask, but a grayscale representation of the depth of the scene that you could use to um, do your own depth of field or other effects afterwards. That's that's a new feature. It's really cool. And you can also render stereo animation, which I've uh, tried a few times with varying levels of success. <laughs> cool option, though. Okay, that's all of those options. So, we want to render the final animation. So we want to make sure we got our animation size set our anti-aliasing set like we want it. Basically everything is set like you want it. You don't want to make any changes to your setup after you start rendering your animation. Uh, mostly because of the way it interpolates between the frames. Like for instance if I change this keyframe right here, number two, it would affect every single frame between these two so you know it could affect 360 to 360 different frames and if you make one change then and, and while you're rendering the animations then and they're not going to match up properly so make sure you have everything set just right and I've got my output folder set I have my file saved and this says start index 1 start rendering animation images and here are the frames it's saving as it goes ripping through them. Okay, but let's say that you want to pause your computer and play some Team Fortress 2. You can hit pause rendering right here. It'll pause on the next frame. And then as long as you don't do anything else, you can go, uh, I mean, to Mandelbulb 3D, you can go play TF2, do whatever you want that needs that CPU time. Come back here, press pause, press to continue, and it'll just pick up from where it left off. Now, if you say you need to turn your computer off for the night or uh, you want to stop it and you don't want to keep Manable 3D running or you can't, so you can you can pick up from that too. So you can hit pause rendering or just hit stop if you're not worried about losing the current frame you're working on. Now that I've hit stop, we can't just hit resume on this rendering. So let's say we had to close out and reboot Manable 3D here whatever so we'll load up load it up again go to the animation open up our animation that we're working on here it is go to the folder that has our pictures in it that we have been that it's been rendering and we'll see that it stopped on frame 24 I'm gonna start on index 25 and I'm gonna start rendering animation images Boom. 24, 25. Oops, I hit pause on accident. <laughs> 26. So the, um, when I first started trying to uh, interrupt a ren animation rendering in the middle, I was messing with these file index to start increment, and that confused the heck out of me. For the longest time, I thought I was starting in a new spot but I wasn't so this down here is you control which animation frame it's going to start rendering at 
So you can always just stop and start it at the last one. And it looks like he's added the option here. Uh, Jesse's added the option to stop at a specific frame, which is nice. That'd be coming handy when you're rendering on two different machines or something like that. So when you uh, get all of those, then uh, when it's done rendering, you'll have individual frames for your movie. And you can use a program like Virtual Dub, uh, which is a popular free choice. I use Sony Vegas as my editor of choice. But uh, I'll show that in a, maybe another video, how to put everything together and maybe go... Um, let me also... I'm going to stop for a second. All right, I think I'm going to show you that one more time uh, just for fun. And then this time we're also going to change some of the parameters while we do it. So we'll get that morphing effect while the camera moves. So I have here just uh, an amazing box mixed with the rotate command, which is a great one for uh, making morphs. So what I'm going to do is pop this formula into the first keyframe. And now I'm going to pop that over to the 3D Navigator. Ah, my animation thing keeps disappearing. <laughs> and then we're going to fiddle with these formulas here. Um, it's probably best at first to make small changes and you never, you know, until you messed around with it, you never know what's going to happen. So <laughs> you just kind of have to be patient and willing to spend a lot of time tinkering with these formulas to get something that looks interesting and something that you want to explore further. So I'm going to change one parameter over here, and then I'm going to hit this formula button. And that'll keep everything about this fractal the same, except change just this one thing that I just the formulas that I've changed over here and I'm gonna move the camera a little bit that looks pretty cool this was the start of my fate of Morgana video this shape that I found here um, anyway uh, I'm gonna pop that over to the main take a quick look at it I love the rotated objects. They just make the craziest details and sometimes there'll be 20 different patterns in one one fractal, you know, one fractal space. Usually, you know, it's restricted to just a few or one single pattern. So that looks pretty cool. Looks like an owl or an old wizard. So I'm going to pop that keyframe in here. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to change another formula here. I'm going to change that to 3, change that to 6. Pop formula. Now, I've been through this fractal space many times, and I've changed these formulas a lot. So don't expect it to be so easy to find, uh, to change these uh, values and not end up inside of your fractal or have it totally be gone. If that happens, just reload your formula and make a smaller change until you get something that uh, looks like it will morph together well. That one looks really cool. <laughs> I'll have to explore that later. That's one great thing. I think I already mentioned it, but uh, that's one great thing about this animation palette. You can just plop formulas and setups in there all night while you're exploring and just save it all as one file for reference later for more exploration. Oh, what the heck, we'll do one more. Oop, I'm going to make sure we save that one. Let's just zero it out. 
formula. Now, uh, I already mentioned this, but I'll mention it again. You can also just pop the information directly from the 3D Navigator into the animation palette with any keyframe. So this one is a fractal that takes much longer to render. So if we tried this preview at the same settings as the last one, it would take eight minutes. So a lot of times you're going to be kind of guessing what everything looks like and hoping for the best even on this render preview, unless you're extremely patient. So let's just try that. I can see right there that I, that's just too small for you to see. <laughs> Let's, uh, I'll speed it up in a post process or whatever. All right, and there's the uh, preview animation. <clears throat> I can see that I went inside, in quotes, in the, of the fractal, uh, and it's clipping off on the camera uh, right here. So let's let's fix that. We'll make a little adjustment to our camera path so we don't go through there. So let's see. Here's the key first keyframe. And that one was at negative five on the rotate, negative twenty and four. Here's the second one. It's at negative five, negative ten, and four. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go to negative fifteen. Ooh. Now you can see that I'm inside of that fractal right now. I'm I'm sure of it. So what do you do when that happens? You can sometimes just hit the parameter button, which will bring back the parameters from the fractal over here. can put this back where it was sometimes that'll work sometimes it won't sometimes you just have to reload your keyframe after you get lost in a fractal like that I don't know why but sometimes it just uh, gets confused or sometimes I just get confused I don't know <laughs> so let's try this again let's go up in the air a little bit Put this back at 15. Ah, that's better. So you see now I'm above that part where I was just inside of the of the fractal. So now I've got a keyframe that's kind of in between those two. And now what I'm going to do, I'm even going to stick it right in between there. This button right here, it allows you to insert a frame. So it's going to insert this between the first and second frame. Oops. But only if I put this over to the main window first. Here, this can delete a frame. There. So now, let's render that again. Okay, and here is the, uh, here's that preview after our adjustments. Ooh, that was crazy looking. <laughs> I'm finding some good stuff even on this tutorial. So now we don't, we're not going through the terrain anymore. And we still got a nice smooth transition between everything. So I hope that gives you a little example of how you can move the camera and change the formulas at the same time. You basically just need to get a feel for the space and and what the changes are going to do before you start mapping out your animation or you'll go insane trying to uh, find good spots to put the camera in. 
Okay, so um, thanks for watching. I hope uh, that was worth the wait for some of you who uh, were asking for the video. I'm going to go in someday and make another tutorial that shows my whole work process. Um, but I don't know. I've tried that several times now too and it just gets it's a big train wreck. So I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. But I'll do it eventually. Please uh, leave comments in the here on the, this YouTube page or uh, maybe suggestions of a, another tutorial I'd like to see with Mandelbulb 3D. I know I haven't covered everything yet. So see you later. Have fun.